Open your Bible, if you would, please, to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. If you wouldn't mind standing as we read some verses from chapter 3 and chapter 33 of the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 3 and verse 17, God says to his prophet, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. But I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Ezekiel is sitting by the river Chebar, about a hundred miles from Babylon, a place called Tel Abib. About 10,000 Jews are there, taken from the land of Israel, captive by the Babylonians, by Nebuchadnezzar. And when he receives his commission from God, he sits silent for seven days. And God kind of says, hey, get up, get busy, get to work. He's telling the Jews that Jerusalem is going to fall. The judgment is going to come. His is a unique ministry. It's full of illustrations. He has a tile with a picture of Jerusalem on the tile. And for 390 days, he lies on one side and 40 days on his other side to illustrate the 390 years of bondage of the northern captivity and 40 years of the southern. But the second time he's given a commission, Jerusalem's already fallen. And it's not just a warning. It's not just a commission of judgment. There's a message of hope. God, as you read the rest of the book of Ezekiel, tells of good things that are going to happen to his people. But it's real similar. Verse 7 of chapter 33. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn that wicked man from his, uh, he shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Therefore, O son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Father, I thank you for the wonderful privilege you've given me to be here in this amazing meeting this night. Would you direct and empower me by your spirit that I say all and only the things you want said? Lord, I thank you for all that we've heard and seen already. And God, I pray that you do a great reviving work in our hearts this week. I pray that we maybe not remember all the lessons and all the sermons, but that, Lord, we would sure remember how you challenged us and changed us and convicted us and corrected us. And more than anything, I pray that we would go back with a burden to give the gospel to everybody we can. Help it to be so. Bind the devil and his demons that they may fail in their effort to snatch the seed of your word away from our heart soil. And do help us to determine to be good ground and receive gladly all you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ezekiel had a responsibility. The person who gave him the responsibility was God, son of man, I. The placing was from God. I have set thee. Ezekiel was not a volunteer. 
He didn't look at the list of available ministries and say, well, I think I'd like to be in that one. It doesn't take so much time and you don't have the little kids get you dirty. And I, I want to be in that ministry. God said, I have set you a watchman over the house of Israel. The position that he had was uh, not of the king, not of a general, not even a soldier, but a watchman, a warner. Well, God not only gave me responsibility, God gave him a resource. He said, you need to get something. He said, hear the word at my mouth. And then he said, what you get, you need to give. Give them warning from me. He had a responsibility. He had a resource, but God made it very clear that there would be a reckoning. Now, he said, Ezekiel, you're not responsible for the decision about the warning. If you warn a wicked man and he doesn't listen, he'll die in his iniquity, but you've delivered your soul. But if you don't warn him, he'll still die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. You're not responsible for the decision about the warning, but you are responsible, Ezekiel, for the delivery of the warning. It's a great story. Ezekiel's a great man. One of the most moving illustrations in Scripture to me is when God said to Ezekiel, I'm going to take away your wife. He loved her. God called her the desire of his eyes. And I'll do it at a stroke just at an instant. Now, the Jews would always mourn for seven days. They wouldn't wear shoes. They wouldn't leave the house. It was giving respect for the person who had died and demonstrating how significant they were in your life. And God said, Ezekiel, you don't do that. And I love that verse. At even, my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. But may I suggest that it's much more than that? Would it be out of line if we did something so unusual as to apply this story to ourselves? Not our country, not our congregation, not our co-workers, but ourselves. Could, could I suggest that Ezekiel and his life and the commission God gave him as a watchman is a precise parallel to what he has told us to do? Not long after he got saved, my dad was taught that he ought to spread the gospel. First time they said, we're going on what they called extension. And he said, okay, he got in the car and... They went to a dance, and my dad thought, oh, good, we're going to dance. Had no idea they are going to just stand outside and pass out tracts. In fact, he'd been at school several weeks, and he said to one of his roommates, hey, I've been here three weeks, we haven't had a dance yet. When's the next dance? It wasn't a Southern Baptist college, so they didn't schedule the dance. <laughs> just was taught that if you know the gospel, you have a responsibility to share the gospel with other people. And he taught me that. I knew how to give people the gospel before I knew how to read. There's a little book called Life's Greatest Question written by Ace Edwards and it had a big question mark at the front, had some pictures in it and I knew what to say at what picture and I didn't know any better. I'd go to school in the first grade and tell the gospel to my friends and ask them to pray if they wanted to trust Jesus as their Savior. When I grew up, everybody was interested in getting out the gospel. I'd go to preacher's meetings and they'd say, I was stopped by a police officer on the way here, but I gave him the gospel and he trusted Christ. Didn't give me a ticket either. Well, they'd say, I stopped at a fruit stand and, and bought some apples and a couple of kids were there and I gave them the gospel and they got saved. Or they'd say, we had four saved last Sunday or three saved last Sunday or ten saved on the bus ministry. It just happened all the time. I'd go to a meeting like this and you couldn't find anybody to witness to. Everybody you talk to is already saved up. Somebody had already at least given a tract, at least tried to talk to them, at least shared the gospel with them as much as the person would let them. And I don't find that now. 
we talk about our offerings and everybody's got a little money these days. It's funny money, but we got it. PPP was good to us. We fixed up our buildings. We got really expensive live stream equipment and we're really impressed with our bank balance. Well, the world is disintegrating before our eyes. Rioters are burning our cities. Hostile governments are passing laws which, if enforced, will shut down many of our ministries. The LGBTQ crowd is increasing their influence and promoting and, 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 and advancing their agenda at an exponential rate. And we're engaged in pointless Twitter fights. Conducting silly social media arguments. Spending hours writing critiques of other pastors that six people may read. <laughs> and the world's going to hell. I'm amazed how many preachers I'm with who never pass out a tract. I'm astounded how seldom they try to engage the waitress in conversation about the gospel. How unusual it is for somebody to invite people to church. I, I've been in stores where I've talked to the, the, the cashier and they've said, that, well, I'm new to the area. I'm looking for a church. And the preacher says, oh, good, you ought to visit ours. And I have to say, well, pastor, maybe you'd like to get this lady's name and maybe you'd like to get her contact information. Maybe you'd like to send her some stuff about your church. 385,000 people, I'm told, are born every day, and 164,000 die. What's the population of Lancaster and Palmdale? About 500,000. Imagine that every four days, as many people died as live in this whole area. If 160,000 people died in one place or they'd make the news, everybody would think it was a disaster, a tragedy. But most of those 164,000 people die and go to hell. Not because God did not want to save them. He was not willing that any should perish. I'm told that if we kept winning people to Christ at the rate we are, and could stop all the births and stop all the deaths and keep the population of the world static. And we can't do that. It's increasing by 219,000 every day. But if we could do that and we kept winning people to Christ at the rate we are, it would take us 400 years to win America to Christ. And 4,000 years to win the world to Christ. This is an old statistic, it's probably worse now, but I, I was told that if you took all the unsaved people in the world, put them in a single file line, it would circle the globe seven times. That's 175,000 miles. And the line gets 20 miles longer every day. But it doesn't bother anybody. won't keep us from enjoying an in and out after the service or make us stay awake any at night. I read just recently that 47%, almost half, of the evangelical millennials believe it is wrong to evangelize. And they not only don't think it's their job, they think it's wrong if we do it. They're so infused and influenced with political correctness that you dare not say anything that anybody might not like. Even if it means that you consign them to eternity in hell. Might I say that we have a responsibility? Amen. Oh, you say, well, that's an Old Testament text. You're taking that out of context. I don't know, I think I read this verse somewhere in Romans. It said something like the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. I think God inspired all the Bible. 
But if you don't want to take the lesson from Ezekiel, this is obscure verse you may not have heard of. It says something like, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know what that means? That means I'm supposed to go out and give the gospel. I give to Brother First, so when he gets saved, his wife will be so happy. I talk to him about baptism, he gets baptized. Then I'm supposed to teach him all things. Now, I don't know what all, all things means. I suppose it means to read the Bible and to pray and to be in church. But I know if you just take that verse, that all things must include telling people how to get saved, because that's what the verse is about. So one of the things I teach him is how to tell other people how to get saved. So he goes out and he gives Brother Christus in the gospel. He gets saved and he gets baptized and he teaches him how to give people the gospel. And he gives it uh, to Brother Steve Chapel there. And Brother Chapel gets saved and he gets baptized and he teaches him to share the gospel. And he gives it to Brother Edwards. Hey, I'm telling you, Amway did not invent multi-level marketing. The idea of signing up people to sign up people to sign up people is inherent in the great commission. The Lord Jesus designed the gospel to be self-perpetuating. But if we don't do that, we're always one generation away from extinction. We have a responsibility. Uh, the person who gave it to us is God. The placing is His. We don't get to volunteer. We don't decide whether or not we have the gift of evangelism. We want to sign up for that ministry. You know better than that. Mercy is a gift and helps is a gift. Uh, discernment of spirits may be a gift. Uh, uh, telling truth, forth telling, being a prophet may be a gift. Uh, but the, the gospel is not a gift. Sharing it is not a gift. It's a command for every child of God to obey. I remind you, this is not a church growth program. I'm glad you can use Facebook to get people in the church. We do that at our church. I think it's great. I do have a Facebook page. It's under my real name, not my initials. I have no friends. I do not want any friends on Facebook. I don't have time to talk to all of you. I'm sorry. I'm just on there so I can go on Marketplace. That's the only reason I have it. That's the truth. I'm glad you do that. I, I'm glad you can. You, we, we started using flyers. We would mimeograph them off. That, that's not exactly the Great Commission either. We started then using direct mail and ads on the radio and ads on the television. All that's great. But none of that replaces my job to share the gospel with everybody I possibly can individually. It's not the harangue of some pastor trying to get more people to come and listen to him preach. No, no, no. It's not an opinion or philosophy. The person who places us in this position is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But can I tell you, we have a resource. He said, now when you do this, you might be nervous. It might be scary. You might not know what to say. You might think, well, I'm just not made for that. Every time I try to talk in public, my tang gets all tangled up and I just don't know what to say. So Jesus said, I'll make you a deal. I'll go with you. <laughs> if, if you were to go knocking on doors in Lancaster, but the chapel said, I'll go with you. Would that diminish some of your nervousness? <laughs> now he's been out with a lot of people. And he'll be out with a lot more, and he goes faithfully knocking on doors and giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he can't go with all of you. But Jesus can. Amen. I was 16 years old, a student at Bob Jones Academy. I had gone there so I could get out of high school a little, little early. They had a thing called Academy Extension. We'd get on a bus and go up to Spartanburg, South Carolina, and pass out tracts. It was the last... Friday night, we did it on Friday nights before Christmas, before Christmas vacation. It was cold. There was even a little bit of snow in the air, unusual for South Carolina. 
I was with a friend named Adver Cuevas. He was from Puerto Rico. His dad was a military man. And Adver and I were friends. Adver said, I'm out of tracks. I'm going to go in this drugstore and warm up. I said, well, go ahead. I got a few more to pass out. I passed out my last tracks, went in the drugstore, found out that Adver had engaged the proprietor of the drugstore in conversation, a man named George Vassy. Now, Adver didn't grow up in a preacher's home like me. His dad was in the army, and he didn't know how to give the gospel like I did. And that man had twisted Adver into a theological pretzel. So I broke a rule of two-by-two two soul winning, and I interrupted. And sure enough, in very short order, there were two theological pretzels twisting on the drugstore floor. <laughs> he knew stuff I'd never heard of. He knew the Book of Mormon. He knew things from the Koran. He, he knew stuff in the Bible I didn't know was there. And, and I went home and I said, I'm not doing this until I learn an answer to all those questions. I'm going to know how to answer a Catholic and a Jehovah's Witness and a Mormon and all the people that are out there, and then I'll go out and do it again. So I went home for Christmas, came back, then go out the next Friday. Adver went. He was running down the hallway when he got back on the bus, hollering my name out. He said, Renee, 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 he burst into my room. I said, what, what, what? He said, do you remember George Vassy? Yeah, I remember George Vassy. Guy in the drugstore. He said, George Vassy said as a result of our visit that he'd gotten saved. He said, George asked he's not selling dirty magazines in the drugstore anymore. And he said, he's got a part of the building he's not using, and he wants to start a rescue mission there. Yeah. Hey, I guess that's a lot smarter than I thought I was. <laughs> no. A couple of teenage kids heard the word at his mouth and gave George Vassy warning from him. We have incredible resources. Nobody need worry. Nobody need be afraid. Nobody need feel unqualified. We have a responsibility. We have a resource. And we will face a reckoning. Oh, come on, Brother Let. That's an Old Testament construct. That blood sacrifice is in the Old Testament. We don't have them now. You can't say his blood will I require at your hand. Well, I don't know. I think the Apostle Paul was in the New Testament. You can correct me on that later if I'm wrong. I think he said in Acts 20, 26, wherefore I take you to record that I am pure from the blood of all men, verse 31, because by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. The apostle Paul said, if I hadn't done that, their blood could be required in my hand, but I warned them I'm free, I'm pure from their blood. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive according to the things he hath done in his body, whether it be good or bad. And the next verse says, the very next verse, no intervening verses, the very next words are, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. I persuade men. John Phillips, whom I highly respect as a Bible commentator, said about that verse, this sobering fear of God should be uppermost in our minds as an added spur to our evangelistic effort. Can I remind you, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not a Sunday school picnic where we get a blue ribbon for winning the three-legged race. It's terrifying, according to the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul was a pretty good Christian. He did a pretty good job of sharing the gospel. I see my friend, Brother Edgar Fregali, our church has been supporting him for, I suppose, 35 years now. And uh, one time there was a project a lot of people gave money to, and they're going to take the gospel somewhere, but they never went there. I saw him in the airport, and I, I said, whatever happened about that? They never went into the place they were supposed to go to give the Bibles and give the gospel. And Brother Fogali said, well, I think it was a matter of courage. And then he said this, yes, there was some danger, but if the Apostle Paul had never gone any place dangerous, where would we be today? Do you know none of us have to go any place dangerous? 
Oh, yeah, you go to bad neighborhoods. I'm from Saginaw. That's all we have. <laughs> Our buses have been shot. Our bus workers have been shot at. Kids have brought loaded 9 millimeters uh, uh, on the bus. A 10-year-old kid brought one a little while back. It made the news. We've had gang fights on our property and several times had to call the police to break up the fights. But you know how many of our people have been injured because of that? None. I'm not sure it might have something to do with that business of, Lo, I'm with you always. Amen. Preacher in his maybe late 20s died. I knew him a little bit. He was good friends with my brother-in-law and some others. I went to his funeral. His name was Bill Packer, and his youth pastor, who was now a pastor, would have been his youth pastor, gave a testimony, and it sounded kind of strange. I wondered what he was talking about. He said, uh, Bill Packer gave a testimony at youth group one time, and he said, when I was a little boy, I went to a birthday party for a friend of mine. He said, I ate cake and ice cream and drank punch. He said, I won the game of dropping the clothespins in the bottle and pinning the tail on the donkey, and I got prizes. And then he said, then the kid's mom said, okay, now we're going to open the presents. And he said, I said, presents? And I ran into a closet and hid because I'd forgotten to bring a present. I ate his ice cream and cake. I won his prizes. I played his games, and I didn't even bring him a present. And the youth pastor, Ron Allen, said by this time he's wondering what that testimony is about. And then Bill Packer said to the peers in the youth group, I'm scared to death of standing at the judgment seat of Christ and not having anything to give him. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. I sat between two ladies on the airplane today, unusual for me to get a middle seat. I always pray that I won't sit next to a BTM. That's someone bigger than me. <laughs> Those two ladies are the answer to my prayer. I gave the one a tract. She said she was saved. The other one wouldn't take a tract. I didn't get to lead either of them to Christ. The lady in front of me turned around and gave me a thumbs up when she heard me talking about the gospel. I said, God loves you. He loves you so much. He wants you to spend eternity with him. This tells you about that. I don't have much to say, anything to say about whether or not they get saved. But it's all my responsibility whether I share the gospel with them. There is a reckoning. I'm glad you expound the scripture. You ought to do that. But be sure you spend some time evangelizing the sinners. I, I'm glad you have a right stand, but you're still wrong if you don't go so many. I'm glad you got a nice, clean auditorium, but maybe it'd be good to have some converts walking down the aisle of that auditorium. My dad became friends with Glenn Shunk while he was in college. Glenn Shunk became a great evangelist. He, I think, was the, the, the prototypical evangelist of his era. Look up his sermons. It'll be worth your while. S-C-H-U-N-K. And while they were in college, they would get on a bus, and my dad would get in the front, and Glenn Shunk would get in the back. And they'd say, hey, Brother Ken. What, Brother Glenn? You're about so-and-so. No, what about him? He got saved. He got what? He got saved. What do you mean saved? Well, he found out he was a sinner. A sinner? Yeah. Oh, that's bad, yeah. Deserve to go to hell. Oh, that's really bad, yeah. And they would shout the gospel across the bus. They got in trouble for that. The dean of students acknowledged that he appreciated their zeal, but thought their methodology could be improved. I'd take that. I have a sermon book in my library. Bob Jones Sr. said... We have 3,000 students at Bob Jones College. A thousand of them are preacher boys, and we have on record the names of 30,000 people. Those preacher boys led to Christ last year. That's about one a week per preacher boy. Now, I don't know a lot of 
preachers don't come anywhere close to that. And by the way, you can still do it. The gospel has no expiration date on it. Lee Robertson would say, if people are not being saved, it's either because the gospel is not being given or because the gospel has lost its power. You tell me which one you reckon is the reason we're not seeing people saved like we used to. Jesus said the harvest is plenteous. I try to be attentive. I don't engage in Twitter fights, but I've occasionally had somebody I thought had a sincere question and I'd answer them with a direct message. Don't want to put the nonsense on there. But there's some people I never listen to. I never listen to anonymous people. If you're pretty boy 17 and you're out there <laughs> criticizing everybody and you're not even telling me who you are, shut up. <laughs> you're a coward. Say whatever you want, but put your name on it. I never listen to people who whine all the time. I never listen to people who tell me you can't get people saved these days. Oh, there's all the reasons, you know, America's lost its Christian heritage and, and we are a post-modern society now and, and the gospel uh, is so unknown to people that you have to take probably several years before you can even share it with them. Well, when you hear people talk like that, you mark down two things. Number one, they're probably not sharing the gospel with anybody. And number two, they disagree with Jesus and it's all right. I'd rather believe Jesus than them. And he said, the harvest is plenteous. But the labors are few. In the economy of God, there's never been a harvest problem. There's always been a labor problem. I spoke to Brother Gibbs briefly before the service tonight. He said the best we can find in the best churches is that maybe 6% of the members are actively sharing the gospel. If he's right and he has a much better handle on that than I think I would or you would, then 94% of God's people are living in disobedience. I read in 1990, there were less than 40 Christians in the country of Mongolia. But some people got burdened, they got interested, and they went up there now in 2000, 2021, there are 40,000 believers in the country of Mongolia and 600 churches. You can still do it. I preach with Brother Hal Hightower rather frequently. He's in Rochester Hills, Michigan, about 50 minutes an hour from our house. And every time I go there, uh, that person just got saved. Or here's a couple that got saved and they're getting baptized. He took a church of a couple hundred and now it's running 500. And they, they run buses, but they have a hard time. It's the safest city in Michigan. And there's hardly any area to run the buses, but they still go after it and they see people saved. Uh, uh, I preach for uh, Brother Joe Shakur in Wilson, North Carolina. There's a whole bunch of beautiful buildings on one side of the street. None of them were there. Just a school on the other side when he went there 10 years ago. I was there in a midweek service. He had a guest there that he he'd, uh, used as a realtor and was trying to get her to know the gospel. And there's a lot of people there have been saved recently. I preach to our friend, Brother Gibbs, Matt Hinkle, every year in Franklin, Ohio. A few years ago, he was a bivocational pastor in a little out of the way building. And David Gibbs said, you got to stop your job and go full time and get into another building. And never told him how. <laughs> He said, see your job as your enemy. See this building as your enemy. And now Brother Hinkle has got a beautiful church building and they're getting ready to break ground in another. And they had people saved the Sunday while I was there. And they're reaching people with the gospel regularly. I preach every year for Stephen Ross in Evansville, Indiana. And Brother Ross had a tattooed up couple that had just gotten saved. And tell me about others that had trusted Christ. I preach for David Corley in Weatherford, Oklahoma. And Brother Corley, I said, I led him to Christ some of that person to Christ. His church didn't even have a baptistry. We had to get in our cars and drive down to a pond somewhere for him to baptize people that Sunday, but he did. Amen. Preacher George Pert in Tampa, Florida did a Sunday through Wednesday meeting. They baptized every service I was there except one. He went to a church where he had a lot of issues and a lot of things to take care of, a lot of financial things to work out, but he didn't stop winning souls. By the way, I preached with Tim Rasmussen 
every year, and I never go there without him saying, that guy got saved last month. I led that guy to Christ out so many six months ago. That guy just got baptized a few weeks ago. People all over the place now. Wait a minute, Hal Hightower graduated from Bob Jones. Joe Shakur graduated from Clearwater. Matt Hinkle went to the Tennessee Temple. Stephen Russ went to Golden State. David Corley went to Heartland. Tim Rasmussen went to Hiles Anderson. And George Pert never went nowhere. He has never set foot on Lancaster Baptist Church's property, on Heartland or any Bible college, you imagine. But you know what they all had in common? They had a Bible and they took it seriously and they did what it said and they saw people saved. I was at a car dealership a few weeks ago. I learned from my friend Brian Treadway a slightly different approach when I give people a track that I used to, I used to say, can I give you something I, I wrote? Or if you died today, do you know whether or not you go to heaven? Now I say, has anybody told you yet today that God loves you? Wow, does that open doors? My pastor printed a track for me. I never had a business card when I was a pastor because I didn't want to have my information on a card. I wanted to have to give them a track. Well, it's all on here. Well, he's the pastor now, his information's on there. So he said, I want to print you a tract. What do you want it to say? I said, put it in the front. Do you know how much God loves you? Do you know I've had Muslims take this tract gladly? I've had transgender people take it. I mean, they're usually pretty tough to get a gospel tract to. And I was in the car dealership. My oil was being changed. And I, there's a lady next to me. And to be honest with you, I wasn't really on the ball. I was just doing my duty. I was just doing what I was supposed to do. I said, hey, anybody told you today God loves you? No, she took it and I started to read my Bible on my phone and she looked at me and she said, thanks, I needed that today. Well, I'm not real smart, but I figured she might just be open to the gospel. I led her to Christ. I have not been to our church on a Sunday in a long time. My last free Sunday was December of 2020. My next free Sunday is December of 2022. So if it stays like it is on the schedule, I will not be at our church on a Sunday for 104 consecutive weeks. I'm a very bad member, <laughs> but I do tithe. <laughs> but she's been there and made a profession of faith. It's an old story. My dad used to tell it. A man named Peter Apples in the Civil War older than the rest of the soldiers. I don't even know if he was a Confederate or a Yankee. Doesn't really matter. He had a rusty old squirrel rifle, didn't have a good musket or anything. And the guys in the unit said, we gotta watch out for Peter when the fighting starts. He's older than us, he doesn't have good equipment. But when the first battle came, the bullets started whizzing and the air was filled with smoke and dust and the screams of wounded men, it was every man for himself. And when the smoke cleared and the dust settled, one of them said, where's Peter? I thought it was by you. No, I thought it was by you. And they began to remonstrate each other. And then they looked down the road and somebody's walking towards them. And one of them had a little better vision than the others. They said, I think it's Peter. And, and he's got somebody with him. Peter Apples had that rusty old squirrel rifle poked in the back of an enemy soldier marching him back to where his unit was. He's the only one in the crowd that got a prison. He said, Peter, that's amazing. How'd you do that? He said, the woods are full of them. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all could have had one if you wanted to. The woods are full of them. Y'all could have one if you wanted to. Brother Hal Hightower, I mentioned earlier, was saved as a Mormon. His dad was a dealer in a casino in Jackpot, Nevada. And a man came in and did a Sunday school. And Brother Hightower heard the gospel and got saved. Later on, he went on a trip with some people from his high school. He used to drive two and a half hours one way to go to school on a bus. That's how rural his town was. And they took a trip and he met people that weren't Mormons. They thought all the people that weren't Mormons were saved. And he started talking to some of those people. He said, those kids are as lost as I am. Somebody ought to tell them about Jesus. And he went to college to be a preacher because he thought somebody ought to tell them about Jesus. Went with his hair down to his shoulder and his 
suitcase full of rock and roll music. Had no idea. Almost quit. He was not treated kindly by all of his fellow students. They called him Hippie Hal. But he stuck it out. He pastored a church in Lebanon, Missouri for 15 years, and they were close enough to a base, an army base, that they got, I think it was Fort Leonard Wood, they'd got from two to 500 soldiers most Sunday nights. They had the free day away program. They'd get these soldiers come in, and they'd give them food and help them write letters home and let them make phone calls and preach the gospel. And he saw an average of 40% of those people get saved every Sunday night. 55,000 people over 15 years. Just one night, just one time. I mean, those of nine of them are in the ministry today. No follow-up, no discipleship. That's all they could see them. I said, Brother Hightower, why do you think we're not winning souls like we used to? And he said, we have the two reasons. People don't think they can. Now, if you don't think you can, get the book The Road Ahead, get the book Team Soul and get the book Out of Commission. Brother, Brother Chapel's got some great materials. There's some materials you can get to help you know how to win people to Christ. But he said the main reason is they don't want to. I was a youth pastor for two years before I became a pastor. A couple of sisters came one night, Rita and Penny Shire. Rita was a little older high schooler, and she got saved that night. And Penny was, I think, in the seventh or eighth grade, and she didn't get saved, so I went over to the house, and her mom let me come in, and I said, can I talk to Penny? And she let me talk to her, and I sat down, and I gave her the gospel, and she let me go through the whole gospel. Mom was there ironing, and I said, now, Penny, would you like to trust Christ as your Savior? Her mother said, she's not old enough for that. I said, oh, ma'am, I'm not talking about joining the church or getting baptized, just asking Jesus to forgive her sin and be your Savior. I did that when I was a very young man. Oh, she's not old enough for that. I said, well, Mrs. Shire, if, if Penny comes to another youth activity and, and if she wants to ask the Lord to be her Savior there, would it be okay? And strangely, she said yes. She came several other times, and I always gave her the gospel. And I always looked to see if she raised her hand, and she never responded. I'd just gone to Bridgeport, been there a few weeks. Got a call from the, one of the ladies that worked with the teenagers with us, she and her husband. Her name was Elsie Britt. And she said, have you heard about Penny Shire? I said, no, what about her? She said, Penny Shire was driving down Mount Morris Road with her dad in their pickup truck. A young man in a small Chevrolet deliberately pulled out in front of them and ran into them. He wanted to kill himself. He left a suicide note. She said, one of the gas tanks had two tanks on that pickup, saddle tanks, and one of them exploded. Mr. Shire died. Penny's in Hurley Hospital, severely burned. I went to see her. I had to put the gown and the gloves and the cap and the booties on. She was in a coma. Sometimes people wouldn't hear you when they're in a coma. Sometimes they can. I said, Penny, it's, it's Pastor Renee. I said, Penny, you, you can still get saved. Penny, you don't have to be able to say anything. You don't have to be able to raise your hand. Just, just in your heart say, Jesus, I, I want to trust you. You understand the gospel. Penny, will you do that? Will you get saved? Penny, if you'll trust Jesus, Penny, can, can you move a finger? Can, can you blink an eye? Body covered with burns. Wouldn't have recognized her if I hadn't known it was her. She never moved. I don't know if she's in heaven or hell. I sure hope she got saved. But I'm really glad her blood's not on my hands. I want you to do something a little different tonight. It's a good thing to say, I want to be a better soul winner. I'm going to get back at it. I'd like you to set a specific goal. One of the things Brother Chapel has taught us, of, they have goals not to how many will come, but how many doors we'll knock on, how much work we'll do. I know, man, you say if you'd make 15 presentations of the gospel a week, you'd have somebody down the aisle. That may be true. And I guess you could just talk to enough people if you had enough time to 15 of them let you give them the gospel. But you can't even control that. Not everybody's going to let you open the Bible and share the gospel with them. 
But I think you could probably control how many times you tried. How many times you say, I'm going to give at least one person a tract and say, can I show you what's in that tract? Have you got a minute? I'd be glad to tell you what the Bible says about being sure you're on your way to heaven. I don't know how many times you ought to try. But I think the Lord will tell you if you ask him. And if he can set a goal for that and do that, probably, probably revolutionize some of our lives, certainly improve all of our soul-winning father, would you speak to us?